who and my whole family who's from Ghana, if you've spent like a hundred or so years being told Britain is the sovereign, Britain is the superior place, we call it, we civilized you, we gave you trousers, we made you human beings and all that shit. They're going to believe it after a while. Yeah. And then they're going to go to that country to be like, this is where we can get a better life, where everything is better yeah. in good old blighty. But then you realize that that's not the case. And it's so evident in France to a point where, like, so, like, there was that, um, so, when Notre Dame, the yeah, fire in Notre Dame. Talk about that, yeah. We, yeah, finally we... <laughs> we segue there. <laughs> I was waiting for this. But yeah, so when the Notre Dame fire happened and like billionaires and millionaires and CEOs and stuff have been pledging millions within like 24 hours to restore it because it is a quintessentially French thing. So what is Notre Dame like as a it's, place? What, what? So it's a cathedral. Okay. Um, and so with large scale cathedrals, they are usually run by like archbishops or yeah. regular bishops. And it, it does contain quite a lot of history to it. Um, I honestly wish I knew more about the history of Notre Dame, but honestly, I never gave a fuck. And I don't give a fuck now, because <laughs> honestly, like the, like, the Gothic architecture is nice. Yeah. But, like, what is interesting is that it highlights one of the really cool aspects of the history of France in that um, when the Roman Empire was sort of dissolving and the Middle Ages started, there were actually two popes and there was a pope in Rome and a pope in France. Okay. And I think that with their like Catholic history, with these massive um, cha- um, cathedrals and stuff, like they do see the importance because there used to be popes working and operating. I don't know if the pope actually, you know, the French popes did anything in Notre Dame okay. but you know Notre Dame Our Lady's Cathedral it's just it, it's I guess it's just like their huh it, it, it's it's just one of their like massive landmarks kind of like our, our I don't want to say Big Ben but like, some, it's like our St. Paul's it's like okay, our St. Paul's okay. like if St. Paul burned we'd be like yo St. Paul's oh, yeah, burned yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there'd be some shit going down yeah but like if we take the amount of money that was raised to fix Notre Dame, but then we also think of the massive migrant camps which are just being torn to yeah. shit, and the amount of money that's actually been spent to stop the migrants from having anything, like that is one of the, what well, as one of the best examples of how fucked up the um, the situ- the racial situation in France is. So, um, I... yeah, it's, that's kind of crazy. So, like, Notre Dame burns, and like, all these billionaire benefactors are so quick to invest that we need to fix this. But, like, people are living in ghettos in France right now, and no one's. No one cares. No one cares. So, there is, um, so there's two reasons. One, like, simply put, when billionaire CEOs, like, on a, on a purely, like, robotic perspective when billionaire CEOs pledge money for um, when, they, when they pledge money for things which have a lot of like easily popular backing then it makes them a lot of money because it basically is really good clout but if they do something which other businesses might not like for instance giving money to colored people ugh, <laughs> then they might actually end up losing clout as a, as a result. I see. Because, like, the class system is so bad, like, in the Western world, that even the idea of helping poor people is frowned upon. Yeah. And treating them as human beings is yeah. frowned upon, which is madness. That's crazy, yeah. So, I like, actually thought about it. But, like, the, um, I think the scariest thing, the scariest thing, going back to the whole, like, migrant camp thing, and the amount of money that's been spent to curb that, so... Uh, the French and British governments together spent about £27 million, £27 million or euros together in order to create basically a border block to really like inhibit migrants from entering the UK. Oh. That's like, they spent so much fucking money trying to stop migrants from coming into the UK and crossing the border. 
Now, here's the crazy thing. With that amount of money, they could have built a fucking school. <laughs> they could have built a fucking school, and they could have educated all of them. They could have taught them French and English. They could have actually made them really good citizens. That could have helped them, but they didn't want to. And it just... That is when you can't just say that it's a matter of you don't want immigration because you have the money, you have the resources, but the ways in which you spend it are what makes all the difference. And what's crazy is that because so much money has basically been wasted, because basically the more you try to limit immigration and stop immigrants from coming in, be it legally or illegally, they're just going to find new ways. I know. And the ways in which they're going to try and find are just going to be more exploitive and more dangerous. And you think, oh, well, that is just going to give them an incentive to not go. No, no it won't! They still want to no, come here. Yeah. <laughs> you just made it harder. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So, like, it's, it's just... Oh. It's, it's madness. So, like, so, in my final year of uni, I had to, like, do a full oral, like, expose on the whole migrant issue. And the main problem was that just so much money, not only was so much money spent trying to stop them, which could have been spent on, you know, building them a school and actually how, or even just housing. It could have been spent on housing and they could have been housed perfectly. But then also on top of that is the fact that they then got displaced so basically, when they tried to like burn down the um, the migrant camp, which they then called the jungle, which you know we can we can talk about all of the implications of calling it the jungle <laughs> as much as you fucking want. But then when they displaced them, it just meant that there's just going to be a bunch of migrant homeless people just scattered all around the country, and then all that's going to do is just make the f- regular French people more and more hostile towards these homeless brown people because they're like. Why are all these homeless brown people here? And rather than, why did they bring all of these um, people here rather than actually do something helpful? Because it's, it's, it, yeah. it, it's probably too expensive yeah. for them to do. Or yeah. they, they don't, like you said, like it's, it's, look, it's seen as a bad thing to help poor people. Mm-hmm. And I don't, like, and it's weird because, like, they tend to, because, like, it actually does help you in the long run. Yeah, of course. It really does. Um, but, and, like, I think it then, my, what I said in my expose was that my opinion, or the reason why they did it, was because it dates back to the problem of nationalism, where they fear that if they really do help these people, it will... <clears throat> it might mean that they're going to have, like, a bigger influx of migrants. And immigration will always help. But, like, if they have a larger in- influx of migrants, then it will make... It will basically, by making the country more multi-ethnic and multiracial, it will basically get rid of the whiteness. And... But guys, you brought us here. What is yeah. this? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> You know, you brought us here. We we were happy. Yeah, <laughs> we were just chilling. We're chilling in the countries, our respective countries. And you came over and you were like, "Come we to want our all country. Your gold. Give us your gold. Come to the country. Give us the gold. And we want you guys to work for us. We want you guys to do the jobs that we don't want to do for free. For free. And we also want to tell you about how good our country is. But don't go there. Yeah. No girls allowed. <laughs> That's basic. It was basically a clubhouse. We'd be like, no. But this is the, it's the most backwards thing I've ever heard of in my whole entire life. It's, it's not. Even, I don't even find it. Back, I find it just purely psycho, psych, psychopathic. Yeah, like even things like, Eng, it be, even being English, there's no such thing, guys. Like the the Celts, the Vikings. There's there's no such thing. Everything's oh, come yeah. from Britain, immigrants, Britain has invaded guys. nearly every country in the yeah. world. Yeah, like nearly. A, and, and every country has invaded them from back in the day, like. Yeah, so I think, so the reason, and, you know, I will always end up coming back to the problem of education, is simply because history is political. History classes are always political to a point where no one in, like, British history classes really talks about the, the influence and the presence that British the British Empire had on things like the slave trade. Yeah. Even though people are like, oh, because usually when you, because I remember, I was at a, um, a lecture with, uh, that David Olusoga was doing. Okay. And he was talking about, like, the, the, 
the presence of the British Empire. And he was like, you know, when you usually think of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery, your first thought is, you know, black people working on the cotton fields, picking all that cotton. And he's like, oh, and usually when you think of it in the British sense, usually British people think about all of the British abolitionists that were around, you know, like your William Wilberforces and all that shit. Mm -hmm. But you don't think about who was buying all that cotton. It was the fucking British. It was it was the fucking British. Yeah, that's true. And then you know we lord um, Winston Churchill as the hero who won as World War Two, and I'm like, he was actually a. I was like, he was not a great leader because he he basically committed massive genocides in India, mm-hmm. and you know when he was like, you know he caused famines, he caused droughts, and. You know, he would systematically exterminate entire villages when he, when his people didn't get what they wanted. Mm. Like, he was a cruel, cruel man. But the thing is, we all think, is, he's the person who kicked Hitler's butt. And it was like, he was basically Hitler with an accent like this. So, like, there's no fucking difference. Did you hear about um, <clears throat> the reparations thing in the UK? how we were still paying back the slave owners' reparations. No. Uh, uh, So my friend was telling me that apparently up until quite recently, we were... Because when the slave trade ended, like, there were slave owners that said, we want compensation for this. And they set up, back in the day, they set up this big fund where the slave owners who, who wanted reparations basically for had to having to give up their slaves the British government were paying them and it's only until I think quite recently when that payoff stopped <sighs> I can't remember what I can't that's find. a madness that is a fucking madness but can you imagine that like we were paying slave owners because they they had to give up their slaves because they didn't want to. Mm-hmm. I remember, like, I think it was... Was it Namibia or one country in Africa was also paying reparations to the French for a war they had in order to get their independence? I don't think it was Namibia. It was some country... I know uh, Haiti is, probably. It probably was Haiti. I don't know why I thought Namibia. No, that was... No, that was where the genocide happened. It was a <laughs> different, different thing. No, I Just... Know, yeah. But... Yeah, that is a... Or or does Haiti pay the American government? I know they have to pay some kind one government for their freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's another crazy... So, like, you... They they pay to get their freedom, and you still say they owe you money? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, But to quickly segue away from... That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I wanted to go on to food because you uh, said you wanted to talk about food. Oh, yes. Let's talk about I food. I found Glorious this article food. about Carl's Jr., which is, I believe, it's a fast food chain restaurant in uh, Denver. Okay. So, as you know, Saturday is 4.20. Mm-hmm. So, for blah, blah. 4.20, blah, blah. <laughs> the Carl's Jr. fast food chain are going to be the first major fast food chain to debut a cannabis-infused burger. Okay. Now, there's a few things I want. I'm going to get on my soapbox because there's a few things I have to say. First thing, I really do love, you know, just the fact that, you know, weed legalization is growing and it's, you know, being so good in the U.S. However, a, f- a couple things. One, in a lot of, like, even in states where it is legal, it's still federally illegal. Yeah. So that means that if you have been doing any weed stuff in the past, you can still be prosecuted, which sucks. It means that people who are now in states who got imprisoned for weed-related crimes are still in prison, whereas other people aren't. And that sucks. Yeah. And I feel like we need to talk more about that. And also, we need to talk more about how there has been a systematic persecution of black people in, with relation to things, especially with things like weed. And now that it's popular with... Like, now that it's popular with more and more white people and more and more 
pretty it, much, it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm trying to find like the most PC way to say it. It was like, no, I was like, basically like,